On April 10, 2019, the European Commission, together with the Event Horizon Telescope, unveiled a never-before-seen sight from the universe. A vision from a remote galaxy, a staggering 53 million light-years away. Our focus is drawn to this, the heart of the distant galaxy, M87, the very first image of a supermassive black hole. This remarkable unveiling gives solid proof of this celestial entity, which until then were only a concept. It allows scientists to measure the black hole's mass more precisely. Who could have guessed that the shape of a black hole is round, exactly as forecasted by Einstein's theory of relativity? Long ago, we didn't know if black holes would be common in the centers of galaxies with the help of the Hubble telescope, which has good, precise ways to look down in the center. Every galaxy we've had the capacity to check has revealed a black hole to us. Thus, we will extrapolate and assert that a black hole is a natural phenomenon in the center of all galaxies in the universe. We're ready to delve into the structure of a black hole, an exploration that might reshape our comprehension of the cosmos. Join us on this journey as we seek answers to one of the most profound questions in astronomy. Black holes are extraordinary cosmic events that are born out of massive explosions. Their mass is concentrated into such a tiny space, which creates gravitational forces of immense strength. It's so extreme that nothing, not even light, can escape. Once something enters a black hole, it's there to stay, forever. These gravitational powerhouses vary in size. Stellar black holes, for instance, are a few times the mass of our sun. On the other hand, supermassive black holes can possess millions or even billions of times the sun's mass. Scientists have been studying the indirect effects of black holes for years, and each piece of data revealing more and more of their intricacies. Although it may seem like black holes with their immense mass and power have always existed, they actually do have an origin. This amazing cosmic creation is a brilliant display of the energetic and ever-changing universe. You can think of a black hole as completely consuming the volume of space-time in its vicinity. Black holes are born from the remnants of colossal stars that have depleted their nuclear fuel. These stars experience a supernova explosion, a spectacular and cataclysmic end to their existence. During a supernova, the star's outer layers are violently flung into space, while the core undergoes a gravitational collapse. But not all collapses have the same outcome. If the core's mass is several times that of our sun, gravity's force overwhelms everything else, inducing the core to implode. This implosion is so severe that it shrinks the mass into an incredibly tiny volume. Think of it like squeezing a softball. When you squeeze it, the ball shrinks, but its mass, or the amount of material, remains the same. It just becomes denser. Now imagine you could squeeze that ball until it was as small as a grain of sand, yet it still weighed as much as before. This is similar to what happens when a massive star undergoes a supernova. I don't think a black hole knows it's a black hole. It's just a, a lump of mass out there. If Earth today turned into a black hole, it'd be a mini black hole like the size of a plum. Have you ever wondered why matter doesn't run out of space when it collapses during the formation of a black hole? Is there a point where it just can't be compressed anymore? There is a limit to how much you can compress it, and this is connected to the different states of matter. For instance, a rock keeps its rock shape because of the forces between its atoms and molecules, the electric forces. However, when under a lot of pressure, it can push atoms and molecules closer together. This squishes the space between them, a situation called electron degeneracy. You're trying to cram electrons into the space of other electrons and they don't allow that, all right, from quantum physics. They keep their own identity within the structure. This state of extremely dense matter can be found in white dwarfs, which is the remaining core of a star like our sun. Consider the massive space between an atom's nucleus and its electrons. If an atom were the size of a football stadium, the nucleus would be a tiny poppy seed at its center and the stadium walls would represent the electron orbits. This fact was uncovered by J.J. Thompson. In his experiment, he shot particles at a thin layer of gold. What he found was that most of the particles zoomed straight through, as if there was nothing in their path. The next morning, he is rumored to be afraid to step onto the floor, getting out of bed, that he might fall through it, because he alone knew how empty matter was. The next stage of compression is cramming the electrons into the protons. The outcome of this high-pressure interaction 
where a positive charged proton combines with a negative charged electron, is the creation of a neutral particle, something called a neutron. You might recall something as neutron stars. This name isn't random, since it's directly connected to the fact that these stars are densely packed with neutrons. What remains after a star has exhausted its life cycle is such a neutron star. These celestial bodies are incredibly dense. In fact, it's the densest known objects in the universe that aren't black holes. Neutron star matter weighs about a mountain per teaspoonful. So much that if I had a piece of it here and let it go, and I could hardly prevent it from falling, it would effortlessly pass to the Earth like a, a knife through warm butter. Neutron stars that rapidly rotate have magnetic fields that pulse, and we call those pulsers. The person who discovered pulsers, Antony Hewish, won the Nobel Prize for it in the 1970s. So, how dense is a neutron star? Imagine taking a herd of 300 billion elephants and cramming them into a thimble. Once you've achieved the density of a neutron star, compressing the matter any further plunges us into the territory of black holes. Black holes can vary in type and each possessing its own distinct size, formation process, and behavior. The most prevalent is the stellar black hole. Its mass spans from 3 to 10 times that of our Sun. These form when a massive star exhausts its nuclear fuel and falls inwards under its own gravity. The star then shrinks incredibly, packing a vast amount of mass into a minuscule volume. Typically, these black holes carry a mass several times that of the Sun, yet they're astoundingly small, just a few kilometers across. This makes them extraordinarily dense, forming an event horizon. Then there are intermediate mass black holes. The exact mass of these black holes is uncertain, but it's thought to be in the thousands to tens of thousands times that of the Sun, and so they're denser than stellar black holes. How they form is still a puzzle, but there are two leading theories. One proposes that they result from several stellar black holes merging together. The second one suggests that they might originate from massive gas clouds in the early universe, collapsing inward to create a black hole instead of a star. Locating these intermediate mass black holes can be challenging, but there have been some indications of their existence observed indirectly, like observing the behavior of stars and gas near suspected locations of these black holes. At the top end of the scale, we have supermassive black holes. These are the big players, with masses millions to billions of times that of the Sun. They sit in the centers of most galaxies, including our Milky Way. We're still not sure how these form, but one theory is that they grow from smaller black holes by continuously sucking in matter from around them. Last but not least, we've got charged black holes. These are interesting variations of black holes that have an electric charge. There are two main types, Reisner-Nordstrom and Kerr-Newman black holes. Reisner-Nordstrom black holes carry a charge, but they don't spin. General relativity describes them using what's called the Reisner-Nordstrom solution. Their charge influences their gravitational field, but in most ways, they're like uncharged black holes. They have an event horizon, but its size depends both on the black hole's mass and its charge. Kerr-Newman black holes, on the other hand, both carry a charge and spin. They're described by the Kerr-Newman solution in general relativity. The mix of charge and rotation creates unique phenomena around these black holes. One such effect is frame dragging, where the spinning black hole pulls and twists the surrounding space-time. Black holes possess an event horizon, and there's another boundary known as the Cauchy horizon. This is an inner edge inside the black hole, which marks the spot where the singularity, or the very center of the black hole, is located. Now you might be wondering, what's on the other side of the black hole if you cross this horizon? There are compelling theoretical ideas about what might transpire if you were to survive a journey through a black hole and emerge on the other side. Our equations suggest that an entirely new space-time dimension would unfold before you. Once you've left the universe you once knew, there's no coming back. Instead, you're propelled into a different realm. Our mathematical models propose its existence, but until now it's still an untestable hypothesis. All of our equations tell us that an entire new space-time opens up for you. Once you've left the universe you were just in, you will never return to it, but you'll enter another domain. This remains one of the most captivating enigmas of our universe. It poses the tantalizing question, is each black hole a universe unto itself? 
Regardless of the type of black hole you're talking about, the one concept that always comes up alongside it is that of dark matter. It's a unique kind of matter that outweighs visible matter in the universe. We call it dark because it doesn't interact with light or any other forms of electromagnetic radiation. We know it's there because of how it impacts visible matter and the overall structure of the universe. Many suggest that dark matter had a key role in shaping galaxies and even forming black holes. One of these theories proposes that dark matter acts like a scaffold, with galaxies being built around it. Its gravitational force pulls regular matter like gas and dust together, creating large structures like galaxies. And as these galaxies evolve, the right conditions for black holes to form can emerge. In other words, dark matter, through its gravitational influence, is vital in determining how matter is distributed across the universe. It creates the perfect setting for black holes to form. Another interesting idea is that dark matter could be made up of primordial black holes. If this is true, these black holes would have affected the dynamics of the early universe through their gravitational pull, potentially leading to the formation of more stars and galaxies. There is a suggestion that the black holes themselves could be dark matter, meaning they are invisible and they could populate the universe almost arguably large enough to explain this missing mass, this missing matter. Astronomers often watch the paths that stars take around black holes. They do this to spot the presence of dark matter. It has quite an impact on the way stars move within galaxies due to its gravitational pull. One thing that astronomers do is to study the gravitational effects from visible matter, like stars and gas clouds. If the star's motion doesn't line up with what we'd expect from the visible matter alone, it hints at the presence of something more. Perhaps that's where we'd find dark matter. It's important to remember that even though dark matter is seemingly everywhere, it's not typically thought to directly form black holes. Our current understanding is that black holes come about from the collapse of regular matter, like giant stars. But spinning in charged black holes might be related to dark matter in some way. The fact that they spin or carry an electric charge can prolong their existence. This could turn them into a possible source or storage for dark matter particles. It could possibly offer more insights into the character of dark matter and its role in shaping the universe. We come across a compelling interplay between the forces of the cosmos and the counterintuitive rules of the quantum world. You see, in the world of the incredibly small, black holes reveal another puzzling aspect. Stephen Hawking presented a theory that links these two apparent realms, something known as the theory of Hawking radiation. Imagine matter and antimatter particles suddenly appearing near the event horizon of a black hole. Usually these pairs would annihilate each other and disappear. But if one falls into the black hole, the other can escape. This escapee is what we call Hawking radiation. This is basically the gist of this theory. Although Stephen Hawking actually described this process more technically, he referred to the positive and negative frequencies of the quantum vacuum that get disrupted by the black hole. This disruption leads to the vacuum itself generating particles that we can detect. Hawking radiation implies that black holes aren't as inescapable as we thought. They slowly lose their mass due to this radiation. This phenomenon helps answer a long-standing question. It was initially believed that nothing could escape a black hole because nothing can move faster than light. However, Hawking radiation led most physicists to agree that the energy sucked into a black hole could eventually leak out. I think most physicists believe that because you have this Hawking radiation, at least the energy that falls into a black hole can eventually leak away as that radiation. The really important thing about that is that not only can the energy get out, but the information can get out. This was the other perplexing thing about black holes. Hawking radiation might also help preserve quantum information. This was a puzzling aspect of black holes. Quantum information shouldn't be destroyable, and many physicists now suggest that the details of what falls into the black hole could escape through Hawking radiation. If you gathered all the Hawking radiation from a black hole over trillions of years and pieced it together, you could theoretically reconstruct what initially fell into the black hole. One description of how this happens is that the thing that falls into the black hole somehow gains negative mass or negative energy because the dimensions inside the black hole get all twisted around. We still don't fully understand this process. Hawking's argument for this radiation's existence was based on the internal consistency of the universe, but its actual emergence near the black hole remains mysterious. 
Its energy field is so intense that matter spontaneously spawns in that energy field. In so doing, the black hole loses mass. The act of its losing mass is because it's sending matter and energy beyond its event horizon. Most of our knowledge about black holes comes from studying them in detail, and we've got just the right tools to do the job. This is the Very Large Telescope, or VLT, at the Paranal Observatory in Chile. This observatory houses four separate telescopes, each equipped with a primary mirror that is 8.2 meters in diameter. The VLT hosts sophisticated instruments like the spectrograph for integral field observations. These devices help us observe black holes across different wavelengths, which offers high-resolution images of their dynamics, composition, and their behavior. Then we have the Event Horizon Telescope. It's a unique network of synchronized radio telescopes that are scattered across the globe. When they operate together, these telescopes create an Earth-sized virtual telescope. This configuration enables the Event Horizon Telescope to attain unmatched resolution levels. In 2019, this collaboration took the first direct picture of a black hole's event horizon. This monumental achievement verified the existence of black holes, as previously theorized by Einstein. Another tool is the gravity instrument, installed at the VLT. By combining light from the four VLT telescopes, gravity acts as an interferometer, which achieves incredibly high angular resolution. Its primary function is to investigate the close surroundings of black holes, things like accretion disks, jets, and gravitational interactions with nearby stars. Assisting gravity is the Extremely Large Telescope, or ELT. Once completed in a few years' time, the ELT will be the largest optical and infrared telescope in the world. It'll boast a primary mirror with a diameter of 39 meters. This impressive size means it will have extraordinary light-gathering capabilities. With advanced adaptive optic systems, the ELT will compensate for atmospheric distortions. This state-of-the-art telescope will play a key role in studying black holes and other celestial phenomena. It will allow us to investigate the growth of supermassive black holes and the relationship between them and their host galaxies in more detail than ever before. Despite our scientific advancements to study a black hole, there's still a great deal we don't know about it, especially the inner workings of this giant beast. Theoretical predictions have provided us with an understanding of their basic structure, but the extreme conditions that exist within a black hole remain largely unexplored. Astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson has shed some light on these cosmic mysteries. Along with other experts in the field, Neil has taken the exploration of black holes beyond our conventional understanding, the realm of extraordinary possibilities. Ideas like wormholes inside of a black holes. Could these black holes serve as gateways to other universes? When you put like quantum physics and general relativity and you try to come up with some bigger understanding, deeper understanding, string theorists have been all into this. You get a multiverse. We didn't pull that out of our ass. That came out of the equations. But Neil isn't alone in exploring these grand ideas. Numerous concepts propose that black holes might serve as natural time machines. This idea is not entirely devoid of scientific reasoning. Central to this line of thinking is the phenomenon of time dilation, a consequence of the intense gravitational pull exerted by black holes. Time dilation comes from Einstein's theory of relativity. It tells us that time doesn't pass at the same rate everywhere, but it can slow down with the increase of gravitational force. This difference in the flow of time between various parts of space-time is enormous near large objects. And so black holes has become a stage where time dilation is pushed to its limits. We can definitely travel into the future by moving faster relative to everybody else. Um, and then you'll come back less aged than those you left here on. Consider the following thought experiment. Imagine a spaceship orbiting a black hole. The crew are so careful not to get pulled in. These guys would experience time moving slower than for those on Earth. When they return, they'd find an Earth that has aged significantly into the future, perhaps hundreds or even thousands of years. Some scientists even suggest that the severe warping of space-time within and around black holes could fold space and time onto itself. This could lead to a closed time-like curve, also known as CTC or a time loop. A CTC could allow for time travel into the future, and possibly even into the past. This time loop concept proposes that paths exist through space-time, that loops back to the origin point. But whether such curves exist in our universe is still up for debate. It could have some profound implications for our understanding of time, causality, 
and the very fabric of reality.